Hey, welcome to May, 2019, the Infrastructure Climate in Cities. Um, we're <clears throat> looking forward to uh, this month's presentation. Uh, for those of you joining us for the first time, I say this every month, um, this is a collaborative effort <clears throat> amongst a series of different partners, um, and we broadly talk about the impacts of climate change on cities, and green infrastructure is a proxy for some of the adaptation strategies that cities are beginning to undertake. Uh, and so we have uh, generally one to three speakers a month. This week, this week, this month we have one speaker. Um, <clears throat> we have a presentation and then a discussion. Uh, for those of you in the room, there's about 20 some odd people who are attending virtually. For those of you virtually, we have other people in the room. Uh, and so after the presentation, we can have a discussion. You can submit questions uh, through the YouTube link, which has been distributed through the in invitation. Uh, any of you who are joining again for the first time, you can go back to 2014, any of our past uh, seminars, you can access them on the CC Run website. So today's topic is climate and public health, and we have one speaker, Mr. Hunter Jones, who is from NOAA's Climate Program Office, which is where uh, the CC Run project um, is funded. And so Hunter will talk to us about some of his projects uh, focusing on, on climate and public health risks. So with that, I will um, hand it over to Hunter. If you could uh, take over the screen share. Is, that... Is it working? Um, not yet. Well, there we go. You're up. Okay, great. So take it away, and uh, and then we'll ask questions at the end. Great. Okay. Thank you all for having me. Um, so I think what I'll mostly focus on is actually a recent workshop that we had in the Northeast. Uh, it was in October. And the point of the workshop was to understand how people make decisions to uh, protect vulnerable populations from extreme heat. And that is what I spend most of my time on. So um, at the end of the presentation, that's kind of where we'll end is, is that workshop and, and what we accomplished. And, I'll go into the process of the workshop too, because I think it was a little bit um, different from a typical workshop, so I wanted to cover um, what the steps were and kind of pulling it together. Uh, and then I have some preliminary results that I'll, that I'll speak to, but uh, I wish I had a little bit more in terms of actually showing some work products out of the, the meeting. Those are still under development, but we did just have our meeting summary accepted for publication in advance at the fall of the American Meteorological Society. So that is available, and there's a link at the end of the presentation that I'll give to everyone uh, if you want to go find that in the early online releases. But since this was billed as a, um, let's see if that goes to work. There we go. Since this was billed as a, a climate and health talk, I did want to take the opportunity, being that I'm the only presenter this time, to zoom out a little bit and just really briefly cover climate and health generally and what NOAA is doing in that space. Uh, and then to go into the origin, origins of the National Integrated Heat Health Information System, which is sort of what, it's the initiative that this workshop is a part of. Uh, it's a much bigger thing where we're trying to bring together a number of agencies and a lot of other um, individuals and communities to understand how we can address the problem of heat health together. Uh, and then I'll get to the workshop and talk about that. So I'll start with climate health generally. Uh, this is a slide from CDC, and what it shows is the, the various climate or environmental factors that contribute to um, disease or other health impacts. So um, things like extreme weather and rising temperatures and rising sea level all together um, manifest as a variety of, of health impacts. So you can see in this diagram things such as uh, in the upper left, kind of the blue part, you see severe weather can um, cause mental health impacts. And things like uh, coastal inundation and, and uh, flooding of islands can cause pretty severe mental health impacts. If people are worried about losing their livelihoods or like move out of a uh, place that they've called home for a long time. There are a number of other environmental impacts that have uh, health consequences. Of course, air pollution is a pretty clear one. Changes in vector ecology is really interesting. So that's kind of changing the, the suitability of different landscapes for um, as, as kind of a to host different disease vectors. So things like mosquitoes and ticks 
Um, you probably read the news about uh, the range of these critters about their, their range increasing and um, more people are being exposed to them. Really recently, I think over the past week, there's been a lot of coverage of kissing bugs, which are known more in the South, but they're gradually moving up in the United States as, um, as temperatures are warming and their range is increasing. So kissing, kissing bugs can cause Chagas disease, which is quite serious. Um, so that's just one example of a, a change in vector ecology. So, but without going into all the, the different issues in this wheel, there are a number of health issues that are linked to environmental changes that are important. But for most of this presentation, of course, is the heat-related illness and death uh, associated with the extreme heat that you can see in the upper left, brown color. So, I work at NOAA. I'm actually an employee of UCAR, but I work at NOAA, the pilot program office. And NOAA's not a health agency directly. Um, you can see our nine key focal areas here that are listed on NOAA.gov. Um, cover a variety of uh, topics that you're probably familiar with, climate and, and weather, and uh, marine and aviation, even we have uh, marine sanctuaries and fisheries um, group. So none of these are explicitly health focused, but health really is a part of all of these, which is to say the information that we have that we produce as, as an agency is relevant to making decisions for health. So the information that we get from our satellites or from our weather forecast models, climate predictions, these are all relevant to making decisions for health. And because of that, we do have a group at NOAA that kind of cuts across the agency that, that looks at the different health relevant areas that we do um, touch on as an agency. So we use a One Health approach. That is, uh, you know, human health is intertwined with the health of animals and the environment. And so we, we kind of think about health as this, as this big concept that includes animal disease and environment. Uh, and the concept is called One Health. So that's the lens that we view all these different health um, impacts that we, we might consider at NOAA. So you can see in the bottom, um, more specifically, some of the health concerns that, that we have groups looking at um, in NOAA, or at least we're, we're producing information and services that, that can support those health concerns. Um, and so I'm going to talk about extreme heat, the kind of information that we're producing and services that we, we provide for uh, risk reduction of, of extreme heat. But all these other areas I'd be happy to talk about at some point. So I'm not an expert in, in most of them, but I have to bring in some other expertise uh, but from across the agency. But we do have people who work Areas. So when it comes to heat, why, why are we focusing on heat, at least in the climate program office, why do we start NIHIS to look at heat? And it's really, it's, it's one of the areas that's a pretty clear link to health. It doesn't, there are a lot of complexities when it comes to managing heat, but uh, at a high level it's pretty clear why extreme heat and heat waves would have a, a detrimental impact on human health. Um, and it's also clear that both in the observational record and in our climate prediction projections, um, the intensity, the duration, and the frequency of these extreme heat events is getting worse in, in many places. Um, so some of these uh, some of these citations are actually a little bit old. Uh, this is from, for example, the intensity one I'm citing, the NCA from 2014. Of course, there was a more recent NCA, the National Climate Assessment, that was released uh, in October of uh, last year. But the findings are, are very similar, so I didn't, didn't quite update this slide. But you know, what do we do about this if we know that this problem is getting worse? Heat's also a multidisciplinary problem, which makes it very interesting. So at the same time that you might have a heat wave, you could also have wildfires or a derecho with really strong straight line winds that might not have power, or you might have a drought. And so the, that's a this this combination of uh, environmental hazards that kind of stack on top of each other can really exacerbate the problem, uh, the problems that are faced during a, a heat wave. And it really means that we have to take kind of an all-hands-on-deck approach when we work to manage heat waves. And even, even putting aside other environmental hazards, just focusing on a heat wave in a city, there are a lot of different disciplines that need to be involved in solving this problem. There are a lot of different people who have some slice of this problem that they work on, and bringing those groups of people together so that they're all kind of working towards the same goals is, is a challenge because for a lot of 
for a lot of these disciplines that you see listed here, for a, a utility company or a local health department or emergency management, heat waves are just one of the many, many things that they focus on. So really getting people together to focus on heat waves uh, for a little bit is, is important because coming up with a, a clear plan for what we're going to do about them, uh, it really starts with bringing all these people together. And that's one of the fun challenges that I, that I enjoy about working on heat. So in order to do this, NOAA and CDC got together to launch NIDIS, the National Integrated Heat Health Information System, in June of 2015. And it was launched really because we realized that there, were, there was a lot of great activity going on in different communities across the US, in different agencies across the federal government, but we all could be working together a little bit better. And the information that was out there could have been better integrated. And so the point of NIDIS initially was really to facilitate an integrated approach to providing a suite of decision support services to reduce heat-related illness and death. And so it was kind of finding those existing pieces, bringing them together, um, understanding what was working and what wasn't, and what some of the outstanding challenges, research gaps, and operational gaps there were that we could work to address over time. NIAS rapidly grew from a NOAA CDC collaboration to include a variety of other agencies. You can see their logos there, and I'll cover those again in a moment. Uh, as well as a number of connections to other groups, like RESAS, for example, uh, and uh, uh, local communities. So I'll, I'll touch on the, kind of some, of the, some of the components of NIAS in a moment, but that's, that's really where NIAS got started. So the problem, that's, that's the problem that we were trying to address, is kind of all this activity, but how can we get further faster? So one of the things that we knew we needed was a set of core questions that we were all going to address. Um, this issue can get pretty complex pretty quickly, so we wanted to streamline some of the concerns and, and focus people on some core questions. So those are represented here. The first four on the left were our initial questions. We actually added a fifth one later on through some of our work with other partners. So we wanted to focus on institutional capacity and partnerships. I kind of hinted at that earlier. There are so many different disciplines that need to be involved. How do you build connections between those groups and how do you build capacity in, in those different disciplines to work on HEAT? Um, HEAT parameters and health outcomes, there are a variety of, of ways that you can uh, represent the heat hazard and represent vulnerability. People use wet bulb low temperature, they use heat index, they use minimum and maximum temperature. Um, how, which, do you, which of those do you use, and how do you set the, the thresholds that you take action at? These are all really challenging questions, and there are so many approaches out there in literature. Uh, and often people will just kind of do a scan of literature and, and make a, a best guess, but we want to really work on harmonizing, not necessarily making them the approach the same across the country or across the world, but at least harmonizing kind of how we think about these issues and, maybe determining where it's best to use heat index versus wet globe temperature. And that's where it leads to the data and forecast products question. Um, once you figure out what parameters you want to use, how do you represent that information? And at what time scales are we representing that information? And so that kind of asks the question of you know, what data and forecast products are really needed? Uh, how do we make them useful and usable? And we can have some of the best information in the world, but if we're not communicating it effectively and actually influencing the behaviors and uh, properly informing the decisions that have to be made to protect people, then we won't get very far. So another one is engagement and communication strategies. And then finally, uh, in working with a lot of health practitioners, we've had interventions and effectiveness. Um, there's a lot of research still to be done to understand what interventions are effective in, in what places to have certain health outcomes. And we need better environmental information to support the, those research projects. So those are the core questions that we started with. And I guess actually functions at a lot of different levels. At the highest level, we are engaged with an international network that's relatively new called GIN, the Global Heat Health Information Network. Um, so the NIAS meeting that we're going to talk about later happened in October, and then a couple of months later, in December, JICM launched with its first global um, first global forum on heat and health. 
And so I, I worked on that as well, and that was held in Hong Kong, and brought together over 100 different practitioners and researchers and experts in, in strategy and human health um, to focus on that issue globally. And so NIAS and Jin are very closely related to each other, and I'll have a link to, to Jin as well at the, uh, at the end of the presentation if you'd like more information on that. Um, but I won't dwell on it here, but just to say that NIAS is connected to a global network that's focused on extreme heat, and that NIAS tends to focus more nationally, or at least continentally, so we, we do work with Canada and Mexico a little bit as well. Um, another way that we work nationally is we do have an interagency working group uh, that has, you, you remember the agency logos I showed a few slides ago, all of those agencies are involved in and working with us to harmonize the, the federal approach to eHealth health uh, risk reduction and the information that we provide to support that. And then NIAS also has a lot of regional and local engagements that we've done, uh, including the workshop that I'll talk about, uh, where we try to understand the context of heat health decision making in different communities. Heat waves are not the same everywhere. In some cases, they may be very dry. In some cases, they may be very humid. Um, the, there are socioeconomic differences and a variety of other challenges that, that may differ from place to place. And so a big part of what we're working on tonight is understanding, understanding what those differences are uh, and how we can come up with some approaches to manage heat given different circumstances. So the interagency working group, here are those logos again of all the, the agencies that we have involved, including um, again the CDC and NOAA, but also uh, OSHA for occupational health, FEMA for emergency management, and so on. Um, there are other agencies that we work with as well, but these are the ones who have been the most involved in the interagency working group initially. This group uh, used to meet on a regular basis. We've been on a bit of a hiatus lately, but we're about to, to reconvene the group. Uh, we had a number of notable successes with this group over the past several years, including running a, a kind of coordinated social media campaign to get the message out about extreme heat. 2017 heat season, uh, and also convening a series of workshops to really drill into the issue of uh, occupational exposure to extreme heat, and athletic exposure, and exposure in, in military settings. And all of those settings use activity modification thresholds that state that at certain temperatures, you should reduce your work workload to this much and drink this much water, for example. So we kind of looked at all the different standards that existed um, for different groups of people and try to uh, harmonize those a little bit. So there's a paper out there that we uh, put together from that activity. Um, we also, part of that air agency working group, developed a portal that has all of the content from the various agencies integrated in one place. It's considered kind of a one-stop shopping portal for e health information. Um, this portal is always kind of growing and changing, and we're actually working on another update to it that will hopefully help uh, happen at some point in the future. Um, but really, this portal is kind of where, where all the, the work that we've done becomes visible. And so there are a ton of resources in this portal, including case studies, um, tools, uh, some information on heat health for different vulnerable populations. So I'd encourage you to take a look at this and just kind of see what's in there. And also, Keep in mind that we're always always working to improve this, so any suggestions you have would be welcome. Another way that we work through that is I'm kind of working down through the, the different components that I mentioned earlier, is we try to achieve connections to various places across the United States um, using networks that already exist. And so I'm giving this talk to, you know, through a, a RISA, or through Regional Integrated Science Assessment Team. But we also work with CDC grace grantees, and so those are grantees who are their public health departments that receive money from CDC to um, build climate resilience into their health departments. Um, you can see a, a representation of where those are located here on this map. Um, we also work with the Weather Services Weather Forecast Offices, and those are scattered across the U.S. as well, and they have a really intimate knowledge of their local um, decision makers and, and what information they need from NOAA. Uh, we work with the NOAA's regional climate services directors as well. So in this case, Ellen McRae was somebody who helped us with the uh, workshop in the Northeast. So we try not to reinvent 
uh, but what already exists. And so we're trying to use all these existing networks where we can. And they've been excellent. They've been very helpful in getting this off the ground. So we are taking a regional approach, and we are kind of examining the local context of extreme heat across the United States, in some cases bleeding into Mexico and Canada. And one major way we do this is through what we call NIAS pilots. So these are basically um, local engagements where we'll typically convene a workshop, bring together a, a big group of difference makers from a variety of disciplines, and we'll just have a conversation about what they're doing now to manage extreme heat and, and what issues they're facing and how we can help them get a little bit further. So the first of these was in the Southwest. It was the, it was the North American desert ice pilot. Um, but the second of these was in the Northeast, and that was the workshop in October. And the approach we took in October was to develop decision calendars. I'll go into those a little bit more. And ultimately, we'll want to work from those decision calendars to come up with some climate scenarios and to run some more exercises to refine our understanding of what information is needed in the Northeast. So now I want to talk about this workshop a little bit, now that I've talked about climate and health generally, and also what the NIAS initiative is, uh, and what we're trying to accomplish with that. So in the context of these local pilots that we're running to really understand heat health decision making at its most local, we ran a workshop in Westboro, Massachusetts. And this image is one of the images that I used to kind of set off the workshop. Um, this was heat wave in late August in 2018, so just uh, just prior to the meeting that we had in October. And the heat index, in some cases, was over 100. And that be hot for the Northeast. That might not be hot in Houston, but that's really hot in the Northeast. And there are a lot of people living without air conditioning, and heat waves like this are a big problem. So what can we do as not only as an agency as NOAA, but also as this, this big collection of, of different agencies and organizations working through NIAS, how could we help inform decisions to reduce risk in the Northeast when we have these heat waves occurring? So the goals of this workshop were to, first and foremost, build and strengthen the network of people that was there. So again, we had a multidisciplinary set of people. I think at this workshop, we had a little over 40 people uh, come in and talk to us about actually heat. And the, the really important outcome we got from that is that they started to work a little bit more with each other. Many of them had, had met before and worked together before, but some had not. And so it was really interesting to see where some connections were being made between different disciplines that hadn't been made before. Um, then we also wanted to identify and document uh, the interventions that were already being used in the Northeast and to understand uh, where there are opportunities to maybe apply some interventions that have been used in one place to another place to see if they worked. And then finally, we also, the, the main outcome of the workshop is really uh, developing these discipline-specific um, decision calendars. So we wanted the public health participants and the emergency managers and all the other people we had in the room to work on some planning scenarios and to really sketch out how they make their decisions and what information they would need to support them. And the way that I structured it, uh, it's kind of visible down here in this diagram with the red chevrons. So if you start on the right, we're trying to reduce the risk of some sort of health outcome or a variety of health outcomes. In order to do that, we need to implement heat health interventions or, or other activities that can help us reduce that risk. And in order to do that, we have to make decisions about these interventions. We have to know when to open a cooling center, or at what, at what temperature threshold do we start doing an information campaign to certain vulnerable groups. Moving back further, we need information to support those decisions. So would it be helpful to have uh, advanced warning in your uh, heat predictions? Or would it be helpful to have a map of the urban heat island. And what information can we can we give you to support the decisions that you have to make to implement those interventions? And then finally, stepping back one step further, um, this is really getting into the, the kind of the research jargon. 
what, what research requirements can we document that would help us improve the information that's available for decision making? So we really wanted to ultimately get back to research and operational requirements for not only NOAA, but for other agencies, uh, the federal government, for other groups that might be doing, doing research to um, reduce heat risk. Just to get everyone on the same page when we're talking about the health impacts of heat, uh, we're really talking about all the things you see here on the slide. So it's mortality at the most extreme, which is at the bottom of death, but then there's also uh, a lot of morbidity associated with extreme heat that we're trying to manage. And even things like reduced labor productivity is a pretty serious consequence of extreme heat. Think about the time scales. So, what we wanted to do in these in this workshop is really get explicit about the time scale of the decisions that were being made and the information that was available on that time scale. So, you can see here a representation of the information that's available at different time scales. You have um, lead time going from minutes to hours to days, all the way out to, to years. And the further out we get, the coarser the information gets. It moves from being deterministic to probabilistic. And this information is useful for a variety of different uh, impact-based decision support instances. So short-term information is really helpful for recovery and response, whereas longer-term information is helpful for preparation. But it's really challenging because, as you can see at the bottom, this information looks very different depending on where we are at that timeline. Well, this is uh, an image from weather.gov, which is basically the active alerts that are available that you can click on and get, get more information about uh, on a map of the United States. And so that's deterministic. That's something that we are forecasting will happen and we're warning you to prepare for. But in the middle, you see a probabilistic temperature map where NOAA is predicting out one month uh, whether it's likely that we'll be uh, anomalously above or below the climatological norms for whatever month we're looking at. So in this case, it's um, October. So this is a map showing October 2018. It's looking like it'll be anomalously uh, warm in the southeast, but then cooler than what's climatologically normal in the north and the west. How do you use that information? Well, that's challenging. That's, that's kind of a, a really rough set of information. So we wanted to explore what we could do to make that information more useful for decisions. And on the right is information from the Fire Results Toolkit showing how the number of days per year with the maximum temperature being above 90 Fahrenheit we would experience at a different, basically at different uh, years. And so those are climate projections. And that's really close. How do we use that information? If people in this mindset, thinking about time scales, I wanted them to think about the emergency management cycle. That's planning, preparedness, response, and recovery. So, time <laughs> uh, in an abstract sense, I wanted them to think on a yearly basis what information do you need for each of these pie slices? And what decisions could you make at each of these time, time scales for, from the planning and preparedness to the response to the recovery to manage heat risk? So that was the kind of the context for, for the time scales. Finally, this is, this is what we were ultimately trying to create out of this workshop. These are, this is kind of a rough sketch of what a decision calendar looks like. So at the far right, this is kind of like the chevrons that you saw before. At the far right, we have an active heat wave, and we ask the participants to work backwards from any particular heat wave and think about at increasing lead times, what they would do, what decisions they would make. So these diamonds are decisions that people could make uh, to reduce risk. So when do you open cooling centers? Uh, what do you do target outreach to populations of concern? And so they plotted these on a timeline. And they also considered which discipline would be making this decision. So is it, a, is it an emergency manager who's charged with this, or an urban planner? And how do these decisions interact in some cases? 
And so for each of these decision diamonds, I also wanted to kind of draw back even further to the information that would be needed to support those decisions. And if this all comes together, this is what a decision calendar looks like. And from this, we can actually start to improve the information that we deliver uh, as an agency. So really quickly, not to go too deep into the weeds on, on the process, but information was challenging and we had to think about uh, how we would actually solicit this kind of information from the group that we assembled. So we decided that we would do this kind of interlaced approach where we would have uh, several rounds of talks where we let the decision makers from the Northeast talk about the challenges they were facing, um, what their roles were in managing heat risk, uh, what they were doing, and kind of how well it was working, where they were getting stuck. So we had several rounds of that, and between the rounds of uh, talks from the decision makers, we had breakout groups where we were developing this calendars. And we started with, instead of starting with a, a time explicit decision calendar, I wanted to simplify. So we kind of started with concept maps that were kind of loose. And then as we progressed through time, we made them more complicated. We factored in time, we factored in assumptions. And so with each of these steps, things were becoming more and more complicated uh, as we moved along. But the ultimate outcome we were going for were these decision calendars that documented everything about this. breakout groups, but we had six of them. Um, the, the team that I worked with to plan the meeting, uh, we struggled to really determine how we wanted to break people out. Did we want to have tables associated with vulnerable populations, or maybe with different decision makers, or different time scales? So ultimately what we opted for was a hybrid approach that kind of mixed them all together. And so the breakout groups were kind of based on risk categories. There were three for exposure and three for vulnerability. Um, the ones for exposure focused on outdoor active exposure, people who were outdoors and really couldn't avoid the exposure and who were often exerting themselves. Uh, outdoor incidental exposure, people who may be outside temporarily when they're on their way to work or have to take public transit in some form. Um, group C was indoor exposure. Uh, so people who might be stuck indoors, thinking about the elderly, for example, who might be stuck indoors in the way. Maybe they don't want to run their air conditioning because it's expensive, or they don't have it. Um, and there are also the three on the bottom, which were different vulnerability categories. So physiological, behavioral, and, and disability or a little bit of agency. Uh, what are the different factors that might increase someone's vulnerability? So I had, I had people kind of assign themselves to these different groups. You can see a, a picture of one of the groups down below. Uh, and I asked them to not sit with others in their discipline. So if they knew each other, I said, please try to avoid sitting with people you know, people you already work a lot with. Uh, what I'd like to do is kind of stimulate better discussion uh, by putting you in groups with people that you might not know as well, um, so you can learn about their discipline, so you can kind of, whatever questions come out of interaction, you want to you know, capture it. Um, During the breakout rounds, I mentioned that I wanted to start with things that were simple and then kind of make them more complex as we went along. So we started out by giving them four shapes for the concept maps to begin with. Uh, they could map out populations of concern they were looking at, the risk factors, the risk management actions, and decision points. Um, but then after that, in the next round, I wanted them to add in the decision makers and the information that was needed. And then in round three, I wanted them to factor in some assumptions that they may have placed on those, those concept maps that they already created, but perhaps had necessarily been explicit. This is just kind of a rough example of what one of the first round concept maps could look like. Um, the homeless population in a city is exposed to high temperatures, which are exacerbated by the urban heat out effect. But you can introduce uh, for a tree canopy to reduce that urban heat out effect. So what do you need to know if you're going to make a decision about planting trees to increase the urban tree canopy and, and reduce uh, UHI. You need to know um, how many trees you actually need to plant to have the intended effect, what kind of trees would make the most sense, where you place them, which is to say where is, where is the UHI the hottest or the, the most extreme. 
uh, and then there's actually area to plant the trees. So really kind of just getting it all on paper. This is an example of the groups. This is group E, what came out of um, deliberations. So on the left is the first round concept map. They didn't quite link it together, but they did very nicely kind of itemize all the different things that we we'd asked them to do and came up with a lot of great examples. And then on the right, later on in the process, um, when things were getting more complicated, we had them transfer all of those things from the concept map onto a decision calendar. So we gave them some butcher paper with the timeline already written down on it and asked them to kind of remap their concept map in a time explicit way. And that's really what, that's the point of a decision calendar is to really get to the time scale issues and understand the order of the decisions that have to be made and the information is most useful. Okay, getting close to the end now. Some observations about running this workshop. Uh, as I mentioned before, a lot of, you know, some of the folks knew each other, but a lot of them didn't. And that was interesting. The same thing happened in the Southwest. Um, and it was really just nice to have, have them interacting and to see connections being made that weren't there before. Um, we held a workshop in Westboro, which got a lot of people out of their typical workspace, and they spent the day with us in this workshop. And so having that neutral space uh, was really helpful to kind of get people to clear their minds and just think about these problems. Uh, without worrying about their, their day jobs too much. Um, another thing that, that was still a challenge for a lot of participants, uh, this is quite common, is just the, the S to S time scale, which is the seasonal, seasonal time scale. Um, a lot of people had a hard time coming up with decisions that would be made on that time scale to protect people from extreme heat. And that's largely because that kind of information hasn't been available for very long. Um, only recently, those seasonal to sub-seasonal products that NOAA produces, like the, the, the temperature, the SS temperature prediction, the precipitation predictions, um, were experimental and uh, the skill was, was lower and it's been getting much better over time. So now that the information is available, we have an opportunity to actually use it uh, to make decisions. But because it's so new, people really still struggle with uh, how that can be applied. So it just, it'll take some time to really find the right way to apply the information. And then finally, um, you know, another interesting thing, outcome was that the presentations that I saw people really sitting on the edge of their chairs for, uh, really asking a lot of questions about, were those that were coming from unfamiliar specialties. So we had someone from Corey Stringer Institute to talk about the perspective from athletics, from, you know, what, what should high school coaches be concerned about? Um, we had someone from uh, National Grid to talk about energy. Um, and we also had uh, Ray Shi from, from Marisa, from the, the Mid-Atlantic Marisa, talk about how, kind of a, a decision-making construct for analyzing decisions. Um, so he was showing people decision tree analysis. And people were really intrigued by that. I think it was because it was so attractive that it was something they could actually see themselves using. Uh, the workshop summary that I mentioned before uh, that I will link you to has a number of insights that came out of the meeting. I just wanted to put a few here. Uh, so I mentioned the person coming from uh, National Grid. Uh, one of the conversations we were having during the workshop was that, uh, you know, introducing urban green initiatives is such a great thing. Uh, it makes the city more beautiful, it, it manages the urban island effects. But then he pointed out you know, one of the consequences of that is that if you don't site your trees properly, you could put them in a place where when power lines sag, which they do when it becomes extremely hot, um, they could get caught in the trees and this could cause power outages. So you know, all of these interventions have pros and cons. Uh, the thing that was interesting is um, we talked about LIHEAP, the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. Uh, and that's a kind of a federal block grant that goes out to states for them to implement um, to reduce the cost of uh, cooling and heating. But in New England, LIHEAP is mostly applied to heating costs in the winter because historically New England's been um, colder and that's been more of a problem than summer heat. Um, and so as a result, usually that money becomes allocated for heating and really isn't reserved for use in summer cooling. But uh, we thought, this point, it might be interesting to look at, you know, could we use a 
a climate prediction to help them determine how to allocate those funds in advance so that they do reserve enough for the summer that's expected to be an ex exceptionally hot summer. You know, let's make sure that they're reserving those funds to support summer cooling costs as well. And then one final example is, um, you know, there are a lot of existing media communication channels for reaching vulnerable populations that we might not have initially considered. And so in New Hampshire, they, re they reach their elderly population through Meals on Wheels. Um, so what a great way to reach people who are, who are already vulnerable. You have people going out to deliver these meals. They can also deliver information about extreme heat and, and really stress the importance of uh, drinking plenty of water and making sure to, to get in touch with people if you're having trouble staying cool. Um, what's next after this is once we, you know, we have a lot of information that we're still kind of processing. We got the workshop report done, but uh, at least the meeting summary. There's a, a more elaborate workshop report that we saw. Um, we need to develop some elaborate prototype decision calendars as well. And then what's next is really going back to the Northeast to have a series of focus groups to kind of work through the existing decision calendars and to work through some, some new potential ways of displaying information to help support decisions. So I'll close with one example of a uh, new information set that we might want to pilot with folks in the Northeast. This is the kind of experimental uh, climate health monitor that I've been developing with CDC. What it contains is um, two sets of information. One is um, weekly averages. So this is for the week of 1 through 7 July of 2018. Um, these are the average temperatures in Fahrenheit that you can see in colored portions. Um, it, that's coming from NOAA, but really interestingly, we also got health information from CDC. So there's a platform, the Syndromic Surveillance Platform, which is basically a um, health system to report up the incidence of heat-related illness that they're experiencing in their health system. Um, that gets reported up to CDC at the national scale, and aggregated up to uh, the HHS region scale. So each of these bold blocks here, these clusters of states is its own HHS region, and each of them has a number that represents the, the incidence of heat-related illness. So you can see, um, temperatures generally get hotter the further south you go, but that's not necessarily the case with the incidence of heat-related illness. You can see that in New England, for example, heat-related illness is at 513, and this is cases observed per 100,000 uh, ER visits. So the incidence of heat related illness is higher in New England than it is in the South or the Southwest where the temperatures were much hotter. That's of course because, uh, probably because a lot of people in the Northeast are as accustomed to those high temperatures. And so this is a very coarse set of information, but it's an example of something that didn't exist before that we're now considering um, kind of piloting as a prototype to help inform decision makers to reduce heat risk. So that's the end of what I prepared to talk about, but happy to answer any questions. Uh, this slide has my contact information, as well as some additional materials and resources, including some of the raw materials from the workshop itself. I think a lot of the slides from this presentation are also available um, in this nice Northeast materials section. Uh, and then the last, but not least, the um, meeting summary has just been published as an early online release, and so there's a link to it there. Uh, but you can also search for it using that, that title. So thank you for the opportunity to present this. Thanks, Mr. <laughs> so we have some time for, uh, for some questions. I'll, I'll kick it off. I have a question, actually. I was intrigued with the decision calendar. Um, and I was curious, is this, did you guys make that up for this project, or is, that, is such a thing used in other fields um, where you sort of take risk, risk mitigation strategies and go back and think of um, things that you could do going back even years in advance or months in advance? Um, is, is this used in, in, other, um, in other contexts, or is this something, a new product? 
So the, the concept of a decision calendar is fairly new, but it has been used um, by other NOAA experts actually uh, for water resource managers. And so it has been used in the West to document water resource management. There is, um, let's see if I can find, oh, I lost the. All you have to do is uh, share again. Yeah, I can, I'll do that. Let me just grab the right slide. Uh -huh. Hopefully that's back up. Yep. It's up. So this this uh, citation right here, Andrea Ray and Rob Webb, um, it's actually from a book chapter, a recent book, uh, I think. <laughs> and then chapter two is on understanding user context using decision calendars. So you can hear a little bit more about this, the concept of decision calendars in that chapter. Um, but they are pretty new, and I really haven't seen them used anywhere except for the uh, water resource management. And because of that, two things are more important to know. One is that um, I could be a little bit loose with how we, you know, what what they meant and how we implemented them, because it, it's uh, a little bit amorphous to me exactly how uh, we have to build this channel. It seems like a very flexible concept. Have really been um, etched in stone yet. So I think the idea of a decision calendar is it's fairly stable. It's kind of a, a time explicit way of representing those decisions. But the way that they look could be a little bit flexible. So that was really exciting. And then um, the other thing was the process for actually generating one uh, was discussed a little bit in the book, but creating all these, these products for this workshop was a fun challenge because I had to think about how to, how to really get to this point of creating this system now. And, and so that's why I'd be happy to share any of these raw materials or to have conversations with people who are interested in working on developing decision calendars. It's, it's challenging uh, because it takes a long time to really develop a relationship with a variety of decision makers um, to understand what their roles are and what their, their daily jobs are where they might get reduced information. It's not something you can do it once in a day. It's a series of conversations. Yeah. Um, thanks for a great talk. One of the points that you made um, about what came out of the workshop regarding lead heat, and I was intrigued because we just heard from a local city official um, last month about how they thought it might be important to advocate for funds being um, reserved for maintaining heat in homes, uh, air conditioning in homes during heat waves. Um, but one thing I don't know about is the relationship of mortality to heat or cold spells. So as you thought about using NOAA's weather data, um, is there a clear enough uh, relationship between mortality and each of those types of extremes that there would be able to be sort of a mortality-weighted evaluation for the appropriateness of allocating those funds? Yes, that's a great question. And I think that would be a way to address this. Um, there are a variety of research papers that have, have exposure response curves that show a relationship between temperature variables and, and some other things as well, vulnerability parameters, and uh, mortality outcomes. So, so yes, it would be a really good practice to kind of look at those connections and to see what that trade-off is, you know, how much could we reserve for heating or, or cooling. Um, but I, I also know that the, in other products, so I mentioned the National Climate Assessment, um, that came from the U.S. Global Change Research Program, USGCRP. Another product out of USGCRP is the Climate Health Assessment. Um, so you could look that up as well as a whole temperature on, I'm sorry, a whole chapter on, on temperature. And it's, uh, I think one of the outcomes from that, I don't have it in my slides, but if I'm recalling correctly, we found that in the long run, we'll see a decline in the number of cold related deaths, and increase, or at least the, um, the net effects of changing climate would be an increase in heat related death uh, compared to cold, cold related um, deaths. Uh, but I would have to dig up that, that chapter to, to kind of confirm that. But, Absolutely, we'd have to get that before allocating those those funds. Thank you. 
I have a, a follow-up question. The, um, I mean, I was intrigued by that map that you showed um, <clears throat> with the uh, heat-related, uh, yeah, that map. Um, and it shows really clearly that uh, places that aren't historically um, used to heat waves are less equipped potentially to deal with them. It, it, it's my interpretation, right? So um, the question is, how much of dealing with future heat waves in places that haven't experienced them so far is a matter of sort of technology and best practice transfer from places that have? I mean, is it, I mean, obviously these places differ in, in lots of ways. It's not just climate. Um, but, um, you know, how much is this problem addressed by, by um, sort of replicating strategies that have always been used in places like Arizona to deal with heat wave? Or are, are you finding that the uniqueness of a heat wave hitting a place like the Northeast um, really um, begs a different approach? I do think a lot of the approaches um, can be shared. And so it, some of it is, you know, what, what approaches can be transferred from places that are already hot and already have some great interventions for managing heat? Um, how can we transfer those to places that are just kind of newly starting to appreciate this and work on it? Um, that's a big, big part of that. That's what we're trying to do is kind of learn best practices and, and disseminate them where, where they're applicable. Also, yes, making connections between, you know, New England's risk profile might be similar to the Pacific Northwest. So can they learn from each other uh, and, and kind of grow in their risk to extreme heat together? And then through the global network, through GIN, can Northeast of the United States and the Pacific Northwest also work with parts of Europe that are kind of going through the same thing? So maybe, maybe England is, is just now trying to try some new interventions that they had in the past, and maybe New England and uh, the Pacific Northwest can learn from that. So I think a lot of it is applicable. But another part of what we're trying to do is to understand that local context. In some cases, there are things that won't work. I know a lot of the, the southwest of the US is it's a very arid, and they use cooling methods that <coughs> are more humid. But that's not going to work in the southeast, where the air is already very so there are some limitations to the transferability of these limits. Another limit is really the, the willingness of people to start engaging on this issue. Um, and it, it, kind of, it kind of works in, it kind of is an issue in all these different places. Um, in the Southwest, you might experience people saying, oh, it's always hot here, so we're worried about it, we're tough, we're used to the heat. You know, we don't need to, to worry about it that much, so why are you here talking about heat health? It's an issue, and you can show the numbers, showing the number of deaths or the number of hospitalizations from this heat. Um, and then in the Northeast and in the Northwest, you might have the issue of people saying, oh, you know, we might have a, a day or two, but it's not a big deal. We're not ready to think about that. So that, that one of the big challenges is really getting people to think about what's in store for them in the future and convincing them that this is a problem that they should be thinking about now instead of the, the unfortunate of having a, a major heat wave like the Chicago heat wave in 1995 or the heat wave in, in Europe that killed multiple tens of thousands of people. Um, I'd rather not see, you know, have to have a, an event like that that triggers a response. I'd rather get people thinking about this before they have that heat wave so that they're prepared for it. interesting to see with the weekly temperatures, the maximum, but as you spoke about the three to four week out information, I was curious as to whether you would see some correlation between these um, health related illnesses and that three to four, the, the monthly um, prediction of the increase over the average um, climate or perhaps decrease. Um, and with that, I guess I'm curious in your in that monthly climatological sort of um, abnormality prediction that Noah gives. Does it also include precipitation? There, there is another map 
uh, available through the Climate Prediction Center at NOAA that does have an outlook for precipitation as well. So it's it's just like this one, uh, except for it has kind of green coloring and brown coloring, and it, it shows precipitation. Um, so yeah, that is available, and um, those are released regularly. And so the CDC has information at, at a variety of time scales. They have monthly, they have three month, they have um, weeks three and four, And then I may have missed, you had a question about the kind of connections at this time scale? Yeah, so if you were to plot the health, the heat related illnesses or emissions on this map, would that be more explanatory than just the maximum temperature? Given that they're variants, it's from the norm. Yeah, so. I, we, we are interested in exploring a number of different um, permutations of that product. And so the, the product is a, is a monitor at this point, kind of showing what happened last week and then what the health, from a temperature perspective, and then what the health outcomes were. Um, and of course, there are a lot of caveats that go along with that. It's, it's just, a, you know, there may or may not be an association in some cases, and there, there are a lot of factors that determine the health outcomes. So. It's just a very coarse way of looking at it, but but yeah, I think the goal is to to actually evolve that over time to include um, kind of a more refined look in a, in a variety of ways. So including different types of uh, environmental information, different predictions at different scales, as well as uh, historical information at, at different time scales. Um, so yeah, we'll have to explore um, different ways of kind of slicing up this data and representing it to see if we can get to the Connections and another another RISA, um, the, the Carolinas, the Carolinas RISA, of course, is working on a tool, uh, HHVT, the Ease on Vulnerability Tool, <coughs> that is, um, hospital visits or ER visits, I think, as a result of extreme heat. And so it would be interesting to eventually connect this product to that um, that model that they're using to to determine um, hospital visits. And kind of look at a, a prediction going out a month or so and see what that might mean for hospitalization. <laughs> so, continuing the volley back and forth, I have one, one more question. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody else has asked. Um, the, uh, you know, back to the decision calendars, you know, as you go back, you know, further in time, um, it seems that. Um, the linkages between adaptation and mitigation would get stronger, at least in the way that I would think about it, would be that, you know, maybe in terms of what you're going to do about a, uh, a heat wave that's occurring right now, you can't really think, you know, you got to cool people down, so you need air conditioning, right? But if you're thinking about heat waves that are going to occur 10 years from now, um, and you're thinking about emissions and net zero and et cetera, et cetera, um, to what extent were the, 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 the folks who participated in your workshop sort of thinking about that? So, like, in other words, constraining the long-term planning by um, adaptation, uh, by mitigation, you know, basically uh, emissions concerns. Yeah, so we didn't... We didn't get too much into uh, emissions concerns. Uh, I think the, the frame of the workshop was really, um, this is already, even if we just look at the historical record, this is already becoming more of a problem. It was a problem to get with a lot of places. And it's clearly over the last three years become more of a problem. Uh, it's predicted to become more of a problem. So instead of, there are certainly some problematics to some of the things that we want to introduce to manage uh, immediately, but, we, yeah, we didn't really get too much into the, the climate mitigation uh, frame, but that is a that is a concern. I mean, if if the approach to managing heat risk is to install an air conditioning unit in every home or a central air in every home, that would drive up the emissions and that would feed back into uh, exacerbating problems. So uh, it is kind of in a bigger picture sense, it is something that needs to be discussed. Um, but but the interesting thing about the time scale, since you're talking about long term and short term is that it, it is challenging to get people to kind of step backwards and think about longer time scales. 
Um, many of the disciplines that were present just don't function most of the time uh, in that in that phase. So if you have, for example, emergency management, they're often thinking about very concretely what do you do when one of these events happens. When there's a heat wave, um, who needs to be notified? Who's responsible for doing what? Uh, very, very concrete and very, um, very much directed at a short time scale. In order to get people to kind of step back and think about the longer term, what we had to do was say, take yourself out of any particular heat wave that you might be managing, and think about, you know, given that heat wave, if you could, if you could you know, freeze time and go backwards your month, what could you have done a month earlier? What do you wish you had done a month earlier? That would have helped you in the moment that you met that heat wave. And then to go back further, what, what do you wish you had done Prior. Oh, I wish we had saved some more lighting funds for more cooling. Oh, okay, well, how can we help you with that? So it, it was really a challenge to get people to kind of stretch, most of the principles to stretch back. And it's easy to think about a, a specific concrete heat wave. Um, it's, it's really just kind of urban planners and people, people of that sort that tend to think about the long term uh, on a regular basis. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, because you, you know, you. You could, I never thought of it, but like fuel switching for your electrical grid could, could fit in this decision calendar along with planting trees so that when you do have to put the AC on, you know, you're not, you're, you're, it's a renewable source or something like that. It's interesting that you're, that precisely this sort of long-term vision that we need to deal with all these different aspects of climate is exactly what's the hard part in, uh, in, in, in building into this. Yes, definitely. Do we have any? Oh, yeah. Um, did you, in your workshop, did anyone discuss um, the impacts of infrastructure on the rising heat? So, for example, on your on your calendar, you know, long term, did anyone talk about maybe improving infrastructure or adapting infrastructure to account for these larger, more excessive heat waves? Uh, I'm thinking about your your point about the uh, electrical lines, you know, expanding and dipping, and some of the wildfires out in California that have happened. Is there any, any discussion like that amongst your, your workshop? It, it was discussed in some of the breakout groups. Uh, a lot of it comes down to, uh, as to be channeled into urban uh, uh, mitigation. So what can we do to manage um, the infrastructure that's already in place that's kind of causing this problem? But there are some really, you know, we didn't quite get the outside the box as I had hoped to infrastructure direction, but it was only a day two, so I think uh, I think with more time we could have started to explore more of these things. But you know one example that's been really fun to get to is and you can only do this in, in really urban areas, but I uh, know in something I learned from the, the workshop that we had in Hong Kong for Jin, the Global Heat Health Information Network, uh, that some mega cities are looking at urban canyons as well as part of their management of uh, the urban heat outlet. About you're constructing these um, these skyscrapers to channel wind so that it directs um, it directs the wind to, to create more cooling than rather than kind of blocking the wind and, and kind of creating stifling air that would tend to be hotter. So we didn't get uh, too deep into discussing a lot of those factors other than just kind of uh, in the, the, the lens of the urban heat island effects, but. Uh, but yeah, that is something that I think the more we talk about long-term interventions, the more we have to, to think about that, you know, developing urban areas to be more resilient from the get-go and not just kind of implementing things after the fact. And then just uh, one more follow-up is, uh, was there any discussion on the urban planners about pools and splash parks in urban areas as a potential mitigative measure? Yes, that did come up as well. I think there's some, I don't think it's on the one that I chose to show, but that was uh, documented as, a, as an example of a, a practice people, people use. Um, so hopefully those will come out more as I harvest all, this, all the content that came from this. Um, I'll have a good itemization of all those different, so, different examples. That's okay. something that I pulled out of here. So here's a yeah. kind of partial list of the interventions that came up. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so
So when you showed the four-part wheel, it had the planning and preparedness, and then two R words, the response. And, and so I was wondering, as you thought about the decision calendar, it seemed like that mainly addressed the top two elements of this wheel. Where in the timeline do response and recovery come in during risk management? So that was, and that was by design, so that's a good observation. Um, response and recovery are really kind of uh, at the end on the right side of this decision calendar. So it's um, during an active heat wave or now less than a week out from the heat event. That's when you're, you're really responding. And, and, um, recovery is a little bit after as well. Uh, but I intentionally I kind of draw us backwards in time to add lead time because that's, that's what's harder to get at, I think. So I, I really did push hard for them to, to think about planning and preparedness, um, and less so about recovery and response. I think people tend to fall into those categories on that, the two are. Thank you. Are there any online questions? No. No. Any more questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Hunter. We really appreciate the talk. Really interesting. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for all the, the three questions. Okay. All right, so we'll see you all next month. Uh, I can't remember the topic, but uh, we'll leave that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Hunter. Bye-bye.